compared to God, man is nothing. Yet we are everything to God. We have a spark of eternal fire burning within our breast. We have the incomprehensible promise of exaltation, worlds without end, within our grasp. At times like that, just look up and leave. It's up to us to go down the road that leads us back home. It's up to us to see we already are what we want to be. Don't give in to what others say. It has become apparent by now, by this point, that Elder Uchtdorf is one of our favorites. Just stop and think about what he testified of, that you have a spark of eternal fire within you and the promise of exaltation, worlds without number. Never, ever doubt that. We are very excited to have you with us on Worth of Souls podcast. I'm Andrea. And I'm Brent. And we are on thought habit number 11. 11! <laughs> Which is to love God with all my heart, mind, and soul. The last lesson, we ended with our testimony through that beautiful rendition of I Stand All Amazed by Johnny Kay. We hope that as you finish the lesson on godly sorrow, this hymn has come to mean something even deeper for you now. Every line in this hymn talks about us witnessing what Jesus went through for us and what he was willing to do because of his love for us. When we talk about going to the garden, this hymn encompasses that thought perfectly. The godly sorrow lesson is so powerful. As we understand godly sorrow and remember more and more what Jesus went through for us, then we become more willing to go through anything for him. It causes that mighty change of heart within us. My sister Misha wrote something about godly sorrow that we wanted to share. Quote, Since mom and Shayla passed away, my understanding of how the Lord can be in every single aspect of our lives has deepened even further. As he has helped me heal, I see him everywhere. I can see the importance of experiencing the deep sorrow I have felt because my gratitude for the atonement and for the resurrection has expanded in my soul by 10 times. I used to let stress, sorrow, worry, and all the other emotions be the governing force in my life. But now the atonement of Jesus Christ helps me learn from every sorrow I feel and eventually have a place for it. I have seen how I have needed the atonement to help my body heal in all ways, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically. And he can guide and direct me through all of that healing. It definitely makes me really excited for the millennium and being surrounded by other people who are striving to be so close to their Savior as well. Close quote. We completely agree. And we're also so excited to keep associating with the saints of God who are doing exactly what Misha was talking about and using the power of the atonement in their daily life to become more and more grateful for what the Savior has gone through for us. Okay, today is thought habit number 11, love God with all my heart, mind, and soul. Each of the preceding thought habits all teach us how to love God with all of our soul. Every skill you have learned in every thought habit has drawn you closer to your heavenly parents and your Savior and learning how to really put the Lord truly first in our lives. Anytime you work on any of the thought habits, we hope you are doing so because of the love you have for your heavenly parents and your Savior. I want to talk for a moment about words and the importance of the type of words that are used in the scriptures. To give us an idea of this, I want to give you an example from President Nelson's life. In a recent priesthood training meeting that Andrea's dad attended during a state conference, Elder Bednar was there presiding. At one point, he told everyone about the power of words, and then he said this, Did you know that our prophet, President Nelson, pours over his talks for General Conference? He goes over his talks again and again and deliberately replaces words over and over until he knows the words he is using are the exact right words for his message. I invite you, this is Elder Bednar, I invite you to listen to each of his talks with this in mind. 
In reference to that training meeting, Andrea's dad told our family group in a Sunday message, if that is what our prophet does with his words to us, just imagine how much more deliberate the Lord is with his words to us in Scripture. The specific words he chooses to use are vitally important. Okay, with that in mind, let's read about the first great commandment. It comes to us from Matthew 22. Jesus said unto unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Sit in that for a moment. It's not just the first commandment, but the great commandment. And when Jesus uses the word all, he means all. He wants our all. Not just some, not just on Sundays, not just when other people are looking. All of us. All the time. This is such an important key for us to becoming a Zion-like people. We must be in the habit of giving our all to God and to our Savior. Jesus repeated this commandment to us in our day in Doctrine and Covenants section 59. This section is when the Savior is talking to the saints who were, who were in Jackson County, Missouri. Previous to the section, the land had been consecrated and Jesus is telling them that this is the land of Zion. Then in verse 5, he reiterates, Wherefore, I give unto them a commandment, saying thus, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, mind, and strength, and in the name of Jesus Christ thou shalt serve him. Elder Holland, (laughs) in only the way he can deliver a message, said this about the first great commandment. My beloved brothers and sisters, I'm not certain just what our experience will be on Judgment Day. But I will be very surprised if at some point in that conversation, God does not ask us exactly what Christ asked Peter. Did you love me? I think he will want to know if in our very mortal, very inadequate and sometimes childish grasp of things, did we at least understand one commandment? The first and greatest commandment of them all. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. And if at such a moment we can stammer out, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, then he may remind us that the crowning characteristic of love is always loyalty. In our childish grasp of things and the turmoil of our busy world, do we sometimes understand this first great commandment least of all? When the pull of the world comes in so many blinding and often blatant ways, do we forget to love God first in every day? Elder Holland said the crowning characteristic to love is loyalty. It takes loyalty and dedication to follow God's commandments, and he is always cheering us on when we do. There are many in the world today that are trying to convince the saints that the commandments of God are not meant for our day. And that they are old-fashioned. Exactly. But they are more important now than they have ever been. They really are so much more poignant now than ever before. In order to follow his commandments in his way, not our way, we have got to do what Moroni told us in Moroni 748. I love this scripture. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, and I like to say my name, my beloved Andrea, pray unto the Father with all the energy of your heart that ye may be filled with this love, which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons and daughters of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that ye may be purified even as he is pure. Amen. This is exactly what we've been talking about since lesson one in this series, that when we see him, we will have become like him because of applying Christ-like thought habits in our everyday lives, and that we will have this hope. 
the perfect brightness of hope because of the companionship and the confirmations of the spirit that we have learned to rely on. Praying with all the energy of our heart shows loyalty and dedication. And then, like we talked about in the last lesson, we can become new creatures as we focus on Jesus Christ. Elder Worthlin said this of the love of God in his talk, The Great Commandment, quote, The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of transformation. It takes us as men and women of the earth and refines us into men and women for the eternities. The means of this refinement is our Christ-like love. There is no pain it cannot soften, no bitterness it cannot remove, no hatred it cannot alter. Close quote. Do you remember, Brent, when he was giving this talk? I do remember this. It was such a tender moment. It was just phenomenal to watch this because in the middle of this specific talk, Elder Worthlin, he really started struggling. I remember watching him and just like grabbing onto Brent's arm because I was worried that Elder Worthlin was going to fall over. But then in the middle of that, Elder Nelson who was then the elder Nelson, now our prophet, got up and he stood right behind and steadied Elder Worthlin. It was such a beautiful and a perfect example. And we encourage you to read Elder Worthlin's talks. They are all full of the higher principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, and speaking of President Nelson, in a very powerful talk that he gave called Let God Prevail, he told us several things about what it really means to put God first in our lives. He said this, Are you willing to let God prevail in your life? Are you willing to let God be the most important influence in your life? Will you allow His words, His commandments, and His covenants to influence what you do each day? Will you allow His voice to take priority over any other? Are you willing to let whatever he needs you to do take precedence over every other ambition? Are you willing to have your will swallowed up in his? Now, my dear brothers and sisters, it takes both faith and courage to let God prevail. It takes persistent, rigorous spiritual work to repent and to put off the natural man through the atonement of Jesus Christ. It takes consistent daily effort to develop personal habits, to study the gospel, to learn more about Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, and to seek and respond to personal revelation. It's been a couple of years since President Nelson gave this talk. Which feels crazy because it does feel longer. Yes. It's been a long few years. (laughs) And, And because of that, we would invite you to evaluate where you are in your trust in God in your daily life. Notice how the war with Satan has increased since he gave that talk. I feel like it has increased dramatically. And the understanding how to let God prevail is always the answer whenever Satan is attacking me. Well, and exactly what we're talking about with the great commandment. Exactly. In ancient worship traditions, saints were required to place an offering on the altar to sacrifice to God. In a sign of complete devotion to him, they would sacrifice the firstborn of their flock or the first fruits of their field. We are likewise expected to sacrifice in our day, but we are asked to sacrifice a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So if we are going to commit ourselves to following that first great commandment, we need to ask ourselves the question, what can I put on the altar before the Lord? Joseph Smith, in the Lectures on Faith, told us something really important about our level of dedication within the gospel. He said this, Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. It is through this sacrifice, and this only, that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God, close quote. Well, and go read more in the lectures on faith about this because it's just 
He, chock he full goes of it. so into depth. It's beautiful. The imagery of the altar is so beautiful because it is raised up from the earth. And, symb- and symbolically, as we draw near to God and kneel in all humility before him, placing our all. Notice the word from the commandment there, our all on the altar. He then elevates us. What do we have to put on the altar? God has everything. So what is it we can give? Let's talk about time. Time to study. Making time for holiness. Or svilupo personale. Yeah, exactly. That is something we can put on the altar. Time to pray. Really pray. We've encouraged you to make praying always and praising God within that a habit throughout these lessons. And we really hope you've dedicated yourself to that, that it's that it really is just a habit by now. And if you're not praying 10 to 15 times each day and praising God through it, then we invite you to repent and make that time available to the Lord. We can also place our time and effort to change our thought habits and place that on the altar. Just like President Nelson has said, that it's mentally rigorous to strive to look unto him with every thought. But when we do, our doubts and fears flee. My time to carry out stewardship assignments. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here that our time is one of the few things that we have, truly have, to place on the altar because everything else is his. (laughs) And when we're specific about sacrificing our time to fulfill our stewardship responsibilities out of the love we feel for God, then we are placing our all before him. In my study of this, I found that President Hinckley said we need to sacrifice some TV. (laughs) I'm sure he didn't mean all TV because, you know, we need some leisure in in, in our lives, right? (laughs) Brett was really happy when he said some. (laughs) Just some TV. (laughs) We can also choose to sacrifice belief. There are many right now who are struggling with questions about the church specifically, either about a point of doctrine or church history, something that has happened. Brent and I have had our own personal questions that we have sought diligently for answers. And just like I'm sure all of you who are listening, you have all had those moments And we personally have chosen to trust in God's timing and continue on the covenant path and placing our belief on the altar before him while we are waiting for answers to our own personal questions. Well, and as the eloquent Elder Maxwell put it, faith in God includes trust in his timing. That's that's exactly that's exactly right. Ultimately, to place our all on the altar before the Lord, we must be prepared to sacrifice our will and our pride and proclaim as our Savior did in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. When we let our will be swallowed up in the will of the Father, then we're truly giving him all that we have, even our very lives and our pride just melts away before him. There's a couple that are that is good friends to our family that has gone through years of infertility. She went to doctor after doctor. She did treatment after treatment. She and her husband spent more and more money on trying to figure out how to get pregnant. They eventually went the route of trying to have children with an egg donor. They had several miscarriages after multiple procedures. The exhaustion of this whole process took a toll on her body and their marriage. After years of struggling to have children, they felt like they had no options left. They decided they would try the very costly procedure of in vitro one last time. In preparation for this, as a couple, they had the distinct impression to put everything on the altar before God. They made the strict commitment to read and study conference talks every night together for at least an hour. They fasted every Sunday. They rid their lives of any media that they felt would detract from the spirit in their home. They made many other commitments to the Lord and asked him to soften their hearts to whatever was right for them and for their future family. They eventually told him, we have put everything on the altar, our time, our desires, efforts, everything we can think of. 
we know you will allow the highest and best to happen for us in our lives. And we trust you no matter what happens. We trust you fully that you know what is best. And a miracle happened for them. She got pregnant with With twins. twins. (laughs) (laughs) It was truly a miracle after the exhausting journey that they had experienced. They decided to put everything on the altar before the Lord, and the Lord heard their prayers. Now, we know many people in similar circumstances of infertility, and their miracle did not end in pregnancy, but so many ended in being able to adopt children. And we testify that putting everything on the altar before the Lord brings miracles. I believe the biggest miracle of putting everything on the altar is the way that he changes our hearts to trust him completely. And getting to the place of surrender where we trust God no matter what shows up is following that great commandment of loving God with all our soul. As we focus on the greatness of God, the temper pressures are going to decrease. We must choose to trust that he directs us and that everything that happens in our lives is for our benefit, our growth, and our learning. Surrender to the Lord God. President Nelson, in his talk, Spiritual Treasures, talked about evaluating our lives and what we might be able to put on the altar. He said this, Part of this endeavor will require you to put aside many things of this world. Sometimes we speak almost casually about walking away from the world with its contention, pervasive temptations, and false philosophies. But truly doing so requires you to examine your life meticulously and regularly. As you do so, the Holy Ghost will prompt you about what is no longer needful, what is no longer worthy of your time and energy. As you shift your focus away from worldly distractions, some things that seem important to you now will recede in priority. You will need to say no to some things, even though they may seem harmless. As you embark upon and continue this lifelong process of consecrating your life to the Lord, the changes in your perspective, feelings, and spiritual strength will amaze you. When we choose to set aside the things of this world to make way for truly consecrating our lives to God, we have to do that with complete trust that He will do what is best in our lives. Miracles will occur when we put our all before him, but we must be prepared that those miracles may look different than our natural man expectations. I have a fallback scripture for any time I feel overwhelmed or I'm feeling bad because some kind of crappy performance is going on in my life. That is, I know in whom I have trusted. It's my go-to anytime the adversary is trying to hook me or when he puts some stupid thought in my head about how horrible I should feel about myself or about how awful my current situation might be. I just say back to that liar, oh yeah? Well, I know in whom I have trusted. Elder Oaks quotes two beautiful scriptures about trust in his talk, Trust in the Lord. He said this, Remember this familiar Bible teaching, which has been most helpful to me on a multitude of unanswered questions. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Similarly, Nephi concluded his great psalm with these words, O Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. I will not put my trust in the arm of flesh. As we come to trust the Lord completely, then our doubts flee away. There's no need for doubt. If you're working on your spiritual growth, you have every reason to trust God and His timing. A really powerful exercise that I've done many times is to write down all the evidences in your life of when God has answered your prayers or just when God has shown up for you. And then when something else comes up, And even just something from everyday life, like your check engine light coming on in your car, or you realize you've left your wallet at the restaurant last night, or a a water line, water line in your house breaks and, you know, the pain that happens with that. 
instead of using the power of your mind to go into worry and fear in those things, use the power of your mind to replay the evidences of how God has always had your back and that he is going to have your back with those things also. If you were to pull a thousand Latter-day Saints, I'm sure that not a single one of them would say that they doubt God and his ability to save his children. But I'm also certain that a high number, 75 to 90 percent even maybe, would express doubt in themselves at being able to attain the promises that God has expressly given to them personally. As Elder Uchtdorf has said, stop it. (laughs) Remember in whom you have trusted and that he is mighty to save, even you, and that the worth of your soul is great in his sight, and he has our back in every circumstance. After the first great commandment, we are told, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What does it mean, like unto it? What is it? What is it? (laughs) It is talking about the first commandment, to love God with a perfect love. In order to love my neighbor like my heavenly father loves me and like my heavenly father loves my neighbor, I must first feel God's perfect love for me. One of the reasons why separating your worth from your performance is paramount is so that you get rid of any barriers that you've built up to truly feel his perfect love for you. Then from that place of spiritual worth, our motives are pure. The more I put myself in a position to have the confirmations of the Holy Ghost, the more I will be able to feel his perfect love for me. Then the more I will feel his perfect love, the more I can then love others with that same love. When I think of what it looks like to obey that second commandment, it often brings to my mind Victor Hugo's portrayal of the bishop in his timeless story, Les Miserables. I love this story. The she, music. Just, she just loves the musical. Oh, I do. He depicts a man in this bishop of absolute true piety and so full of love for the vagrant Jean Valjean, whom he took in off the street and provided food and shelter only to then have his few worldly possessions stolen by the very man he had served. This man, almost unbelievably, were it not for our own experience with such divine character in some of the people around us, he chose forgiveness and mercy when he had the opportunity to imprison the thief. Instead, he made of him a gift of the rest of his precious silver, those candlesticks, And he testified to Jean Valjean of his eternal soul and the love God has for him. And as often is the case in our lives, the bishop played a small role in Hugo's story, but an absolutely pivotal role in the life of the main character. Well, and I would invite you to think about those people that you have felt in your life that have had the true love of God in their heart and even Even if you only met him once. Just a moment, the way that they placed something within you. Yeah. When we choose to obey the first great commandment to love God with our all, we will unavoidably love and serve our fellow men. We will come to know, as Hugo so eloquently put it, to love another person is to see the face of God. Yeah, that that is what makes me cry every single time I watch this and listen to that music is that phrase right there. It is also very, very important as we're talking about these two commandments to understand the sequence and how vital the sequence of how they come, how vital it is to our spiritual health. The second commandment of loving others, even with its importance, Jesus didn't categorize as great. Remember when we talked about the power of words Only the first commandment Jesus categorized as great. The reason why is because if we love others before God, then that will quickly put us where? Into the terrestrial terrestrial kingdom. kingdom. Right. Sometimes instead of being God-centered, we can become self-centered, spouse-centered, work-centered, children-centered, cause-centered. 
there are numerous different types of centeredness that we can become. And so many of them really can be considered good. But if we're not Christ-centered, then we, we are out of balance. And when we get out of balance and love others before God, then we are actually falling away from him. It is possible to serve your fellow man without loving God first, and that leads to a temporal focus. Examples of this abound everywhere in the world. And in the church, especially in the last several years, we've seen many people, especially parents, who have left the covenant path to follow their wayward children. And those well-meaning parents feel like that they are choosing to love their kids because they've misconstrued some doctrine and they feel like that the church doesn't love their children anymore. But in reality, these parents have chosen that loving their kids is more important than the covenants that they keep and loving the Lord their God within those covenants. If you're watching the video with us, we have a few images of people giving charity. One is one of those images is from a very successful YouTuber that filmed himself giving a homeless man $10,000. Now, obviously, there's absolutely nothing wrong with helping those in need, and I don't fault anybody ever for doing that. But what I would ask him is, what is your motive? Are you doing this out of the love that you have for Heavenly Father? Or... And our motives can be misconstrued. And if the motive is to make themselves feel better or in worst case scenario to garner likes and clicks online, then that service will value them little more than a place in the terrestrial kingdom. Elder Scott, in his talk, Putting First Things First, talked about this. He said, Are there so many fascinating, exciting things to do or so many challenges pressing down upon you that it is hard to keep focused on that which is essential? When things of the world crowd in, all too often the wrong things take highest priority. Then it is easy to forget the fundamental purpose of life. Satan has a powerful tool to use against good people. It is distraction. He would have good people fill life with good things so that there's no room for the essential ones. Elder Scott gave this talk 20 years ago. Brent. 2001. That was 20, over 20 years ago. This was before social media ever existed. Oh, those were the days. (laughs) I know. I miss those days. (laughs) If we thought that there were distractions then, oh my gosh, how many more distractions do we have now? But no matter what the distractions are and no matter when we have lived, there's no excuse to not love God first. When we love God first and truly love God first, how does he then ask us to serve him? Because he has everything. He doesn't really need us to, you know, give him something. Besides our hearts, but he asks us to serve him by loving other people. So when we put the first great commandment first, we automatically follow the second commandment of loving our fellow man. And we cannot overemphasize enough the importance to saying yes to God first. King Benjamin was a really powerful example of this. He tells us, Behold, I say unto you that because I said unto you that I had spent my days in your service, I do not desire to boast, for I had only been in the service of God. And behold, I tell you these things that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. King Benjamin knew how to be God-centered first, not others-centered. And the result was loving everyone around him. He was an amazing leader who pulled his people into the greatness of all the points of the doctrine in the gospel in every single way. Like we said, let's reiterate, we can serve our fellow men without loving God, but we cannot love God without being filled with a desire to serve our fellow men. When we're God-centered first and the world around us, which can unfortunately include our family, our our own families at times, tries to convince us that in order to love them or anyone else, 
that we have to disagree with the doctrine of the church, we can practice our skills. We will be able to separate their worth from their performance and love them. And still the Holy Ghost can testify that the doctrine of the kingdom of God is true and secure. We will not allow anything to separate us from our covenants that we have made with our Heavenly Father. As we're talking about loving our neighbors, we want to talk about the difference between loving our neighbor and trusting our neighbor. There is a very important distinction here. According to God's commandments, it is required of us to love all men. But trust is something that must be earned. We want to put a warning out that it is really important to listen to the Spirit so you do not put yourself in a situation where you could be taken advantage of or even hurt when you are trying to love and serve your fellow men. Sometimes we can find ourselves saying, oh, I just don't want to hurt their feelings. So we go against our gut and that inspiration from the Spirit, and we use, quote, loving them as an excuse to put ourselves into a situation that the Spirit has tried to keep us from. We have a friend named Brian who shared with us an experience from his life that depicts how important it is to love everyone, but trust carefully and follow the boundaries that the Spirit sets. He said this, I have a sister who is raising her family outside the teachings of the gospel. She and my wife were having kids at the same time, so we have kids really close in age to each other. And for a number of years, our kids loved playing with their cousins. They were best friends. As the years passed, my sister's family grew more and more vocally bitter towards the church and its teachings, and they were exposing their young kids to a lot of media that we were not comfortable exposing our kids to at that young age. My wife and I agonized over what to do with this situation and the relationships with our beloved family. As we prayed and fasted over it, we received an answer that we did not expect. We felt inspired to cut off all contact with my sister's family. My other siblings and my parents completely disagreed with our decision and accused us of being judgmental, but we knew we were following the Spirit. A few months after making this decision and suffering the pains of having to communicate it to my sister, it came to light that a devastating situation of sexual abuse had been happening in their home as a result of ongoing exposure to pornography between four of their children, all those that were the ages of our children. We were heartbroken to hear of the tragedy that had occurred, but simultaneously overwhelmed with gratitude that the Lord had protected our children from that same abuse and the scars that it could have left on them long into their adult lives. Our other family that had accused us of judgmental feelings quickly apologized and applauded our decision to follow the Spirit. Close quote. When Brian shared this with us, He reiterated how much he loves his sister and all her children and the sadness he and his wife feel for how unsafe it is for their children to be around their cousins, but that he prays all the time that one day it will change and that his sister and her family will once again find the light of the restored gospel. Every soul is precious in the sight of God. Why do you think the church sends ministers out to the state prison? Because the brethren understand the principle that every soul is precious in the sight of God. But you don't see the church advocating for the release of these men and women that are incarcerated. Because the brethren also understand that boundaries must exist. And just because we need to set a boundary, it doesn't mean that we don't love someone. We can see them as God sees them and still set loving boundaries according to what the Spirit has told us and inspired us to do. Let's now go back to the first great commandment and talk to talk about the positive consequences of putting our all on the altar and carrying out our stewardships because of our love for God. Positive consequence number one, we become like Christ. In John, it tells us this, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So according to John, When we put Heavenly Father first in our lives and seek His will, we are doing the same thing that Jesus did. And therefore, in that, we are becoming like Jesus. (laughs) I love that. 
Number two, positive consequence. What we send out comes back to us. That which ye sow, so shall ye reap. In Alma 41, it tells us this. Therefore, my son, see that ye are merciful unto your brethren. Deal justly. Judge righteously. Do good continually. And if ye do all these things, then ye shall receive your reward. Yea, ye shall have mercy restored unto you again. Ye shall have justice restored unto you again. Ye shall have righteous judgment restored unto you again. And ye shall have good rewarded unto you again. For that which ye do send out shall return unto you again and be restored. I think sometimes when we read that in Alma, we assume that we're talking about being restored um, when we get to the other side of the veil. And that is true. But it's also true here that those things will be restored to us here in this life as well, because the Lord is good. He's just so good. All the time. Yeah. All the, the Lord is good all the time and all the time the Lord is good. Every time we put him first in our lives, he gives us dividends that are un matched. So many evidences that Brent and I have, and I'm sure that you have those evidences as well. So what you're sending, what are you sending out into the universe? If you send out love, love comes back. If you send out mercy, it comes back. If you plant honesty, justice, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, then that is what you will harvest. We do need to practice patience because it sometimes takes time. <laughs> and sometimes we need patience to come back to us. Yeah, exactly. All the time we need patience to come back to us. <laughs> we shared this scripture from Alma with you in a previous lesson. And in that, we were talking about staying spiritually focused when you have a child that might be treating you badly. But this principle is much broader than just our relationships. It applies to every aspect of our lives. In the movie and book, The Secret by Rhonda Byrne, she did a great job of bringing this principle to light, to the to co the consciousness of just humanity in general. But Brent and I have talked several times about how incomplete her conclusions are because there's no mention of Jesus Christ and serving Heavenly Father in that. Every law of the universe, like the law of vibration, law of cause and effect, law of compensation— the law of reaping and sowing, the law of attraction, and all of the others that you could tick off, they're all subsidiary to God's law that has been revealed under the restoration of the priesthood. And they are all subsidiary to the first and great commandment of loving God with all that we have. There are many people right now who are understanding more and more about the laws of the universe. And I will raise my hand because I'm one of them. <laughs> I love to study them, especially scientifically. Oh, my goodness. It just brings so much to your mind. But all of that knowledge will avail you nothing if it isn't Christ-centered. In this secular world, Jesus is not a part of those conversations. And that is dangerous to the soul because we forget about who gave us the availability to have everything in the first place, including all of those laws. You could tell I have a soapbox about this. <laughs> Jesus told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the bridge. There is no other way. We cannot do it in and of ourselves, no matter what law we try to follow. Be mindful of carrying out each stewardship assignment in your life for God and know that you're sowing seeds that will continue to bring forth fruit into the eternities because of his goodness and not necessarily our own. Okay, what else happens when we carry out our stewardship assignments out of our love for God? The powers of heaven become available to us. This one is exciting. <laughs> in Doctrine and Covenants 121, it says this, that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven, and that the powers of heaven cannot be controlled or handled only upon the principles of righteousness. President Nelson talked about bringing the powers of heaven into our lives in that same talk we mentioned earlier, Spiritual Treasures. He said this, How do I draw the Savior's power into my life? You won't find this process spelled out in any manual. The Holy Ghost will be your personal tutor as you seek to understand what the Lord would have you know and do. This process 
is neither quick nor easy, but it is spiritually invigorating. What could possibly be more exciting than to labor with the Spirit to understand God's power, priesthood power? I was so excited when I heard this talk from President Nelson. I was jumping out of my seat in this talk about everything. (laughs) Because our impressions of what he is describing is the study of sanctification and having a second comforter experience. He's inviting us to bring these truths from the source of all truth in our lives, the Holy Ghost. If you want to pull on that thread, start doing research about the powers of heaven and what they really are and how they open up a totally different level of relationship between you and the Lord. It really is a very exciting topic. Okay, the fourth way. Positive consequence. The fourth positive consequence is that we are going to receive the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Yeah, I need more of those in my life. More. I need more of those. (laughs) As as Stuart Smiley said on Saturday Night Live, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Isn't this the way that we get the fruits of the Spirit rooted into us? We just have to say positive, really Warm, Warm and fuzzy, fuzzy things, things in, the, in mirror. the mirror. That's all we have to do, right? <laughs> no. Remember that affirmations are different from confirmations. We can say positive things in the mirror all day, but a confirmation from the Spirit that what we are telling ourselves is truth is what causes those truths to become rooted in our souls. And please never forget you are good enough, you are smart enough, and there are lots of people that love you. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. The last positive consequence we'll talk about is we retain in remembrance the greatness of God. Again, from King Benjamin, he tells us, as ye have come to the knowledge of the glory of God, or if ye have known of his goodness and have tasted of his love and have received a remission of your sins, which he's talking about all of us there, by the way, I would that ye should remember And always retain in remembrance the greatness of God and your own nothingness and his goodness and long-suffering towards you unworthy creatures and humble yourselves even in the depths of humility. In this scripture, what is nothingness referring to? We want to clarify that it is not talking about our worth in the sight of God. Like we've mentioned, ad nauseum, like, I mean, you know, it's the name of our podcast, (laughs) that our worth was established in the heavens long before we ever got here. And your soul is great in his sight. The nothingness that is being talked about here is our performance. No matter what we do, it will never be enough. That is what the nothingness is talking about. Jesus Christ He is the entire bridge. It is not my performances that qualify me for the riches of eternity, but the grace of Christ that comes from my heavenly Father because of my Savior. And this is reiterated in so many scriptures. In Mosiah, I say, if you should serve him with your whole souls, yet you would be unprofitable servants. In John, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. This is the big reason why the pure gospel of Jesus Christ is truly so exciting. <laughs> it's because of Jesus. All of the gifts of eternity have already been paid for in full by my Savior. And he extends those gifts to me freely along the covenant path. My part, what I, Andrea Palmer, can put on the altar is my time, my belief, my will, and my soul, my all. When the love of God is dominant in the hearts of the people, there are amazing results. For 200 years after Christ visited the Americas, They lived in peace. How is that possible, knowing what you know about humans? Let's read about it in 4th Nephi. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God, which did dwell in the hearts of the people. 
So how does the love of God dwell in the hearts of people? Well, obviously, for 200 years, only they had magical children, magical children yes. were born to these righteous Nephites. <laughs> and they were given above average gifts. And that's why they were able to maintain this yeah, Zion-like they, society. They popped out just able and stayed there forever. Obviously. <laughs> no. Because everything they did was because of God being the center of their hearts. They taught their children how to do it too. They didn't have any more spiritual ability than you and I do. Although I can't wait until we have the same experience that that first generation had to witness physically touching and hugging Jesus and being in his presence. But you have to remember that each subsequent generation didn't have that for 200 years, and they still maintained that Zion-like society. The evidence that we have of the changes that were wrought in the hearts of those Nephites from their com- was from their commitment to love God first. And the evidence is that they had no contention among them. But what about when there is contention? Right, exactly. What What about like, you know, 20 in, in 2022, 2025, 2020, 2030? What about during COVID? There was no contention then. <laughs> So in our day, let's look at what it looks like to practice this in the midst of a wicked society. And is it still possible to have that level of the love of God? Is it still possible to be a Zion-like person in this wickedness? There's no better example of this than Mormon. In the Book of Mormon— Yeah, not to be mistaken for the actual Book of Mormon. (laughs) He writes that when the Nephites that he was leading were, were done with the battle they had won— His soldiers were boasting in and of themselves. Mormon said, and notice how he focuses on their worth here, even though their performance was not good. He says, behold, I had led them, notwithstanding their wickedness. I had led them many times to battle and had loved them according to the love of God, which was in me with all my heart. And my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith because of the hardness of their hearts. Mormon focused on the worth of the people around him. He did not focus on their wickedness. Even in the midst of a war-torn society, Mormon was ready to walk into Zion and be with Christ at any time because of his love for his fellow men. Mormon shows another amazing result of loving God first, and that is being able to withstand the evil around us. We can use a lot of that. We can. We, we need that in our lives. Are we loving those around us in this wicked world? And are we able to separate their worth from their performance? Right. E- even if their performance is disagreeing with you politically on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> like, those social media fights, especially in a political year, are oh, just brutal. Yeah. Yeah, get get unhooked from it, you guys. It's not worth it. The Lord is preparing us right now to be as a, a Zion-like society. The prophets and apostles have been pleading with us to rid ourselves of contention. President Nelson, in his Let God Prevail talk, told us this. The Lord is gathering those who will choose to let God be the most important influence in their lives. For centuries, prophets have foretold this gathering, and it is happening right now as an essential prelude to the second coming of the Lord. It is the most important work in the world. President Nelson and all of the apostles, they really I feel like that they have been pleading with us to get rid of the contention within us, within our hearts, within our families, within our land. And the reason why is because God is gathering those who are ready to have him be their God fully in their hearts. And the Lord, he's preparing us for another Zion-like society. It just fills me with such excitement. The Lord is gathering his people right now. He's gathering the people who are willing to put their all on the altar and let him prevail in their lives. The Lord is doing his work in amazing ways right now, leading people's hearts all over the world to find Jesus Christ. In this spiritual war that's going on everywhere, Satan is trying to scatter the hearts of the covenant people of God. Do not let him scatter your heart. 
Satan, he is unashamed and he is deliberate and he's scattering people through anger and doubts and fighting and fear. Many prophets have told us that as we get closer and closer to the second coming of the Savior, that Satan is going to keep not trying to hide his ways anymore. Nothing is subtle like it used to be. He's even more blatant now than ever before with making evil look good and good look evil. But by using the thought habits of Jesus Christ, you can remain spiritually focused. You've got the ability to put on the armor of God, and you will be able to withstand the fiery darts of the adversary and not be led astray. Okay, with that, soapbox, I'll get off my soapboxes. <laughs> It's time for Alma's process of change. Today, we want to invite you to plant this seed. I can put my all on the altar and trust God every day, regardless of what shows up in my life. This takes a lot of spiritual maturity. There is a reason. We've said this before. The thought habits come in order that they are for a very good reason. First, awake and arouse your faculties to see as Christ sees. In your study over the next few days, remember how carefully the Lord chooses his words. Just like we talked about with how President Nelson prepares for conference, pay attention to the words used and how deliberate those words are as you review the conference talks and the scriptures that we've provided to gain a deeper understanding of the great commandment to love God with our everything. Next is to exercise a particle of faith so that you can think as Christ thinks. In your everyday experiences or in your significant trial that you might be facing right now, identify those stewardship assignments and really feel what you can place on the altar before the Lord that will result in you presenting before him a broken heart and a contrite spirit. It might be your time to study. It might be sacrificing your time to be in the temple, or it might be setting aside that favorite TV show. <laughs> Mind your business, President Hinckley. <laughs> be intentional about this exercise and write down what you were inspired to put on the altar so that you can make a commitment to the Lord and follow through with it. Next, a desire to believe and let this desire work in you to feel as Christ feels. Pray for confirmation that giving your all to the Lord, whatever that looks like for you, is enough. It will keep you on the bridge that Christ has built for you. You don't have to worry if you're doing enough when you are truly doing your best. You can trust the Lord Write down the evidences in your life about how he has already followed through for you. And as you're seeking for confirmations, get those evidences out in order to help grow this seed. Use the eye of faith to see yourself becoming like Jesus Christ. See yourself, picture yourself being surrounded by the powers of heaven. See yourself planting the seeds of the spirit and harvesting all the goodness of what that means for your life right now and in eternity. Using the eye of faith, it exercises your spiritual muscles to gain the bigger view. It helps you to not be myopic, that famous word from President Nelson, myopic. Lastly, give place for a portion of my word. By searching, pondering, and praying over the next couple of days about loving God with all your heart, might, mind, and soul. Not because we asked you to, but because you truly, deeply feel that love for Jesus Christ. And don't cast these truths out by your unbelief. Satan will obviously show up and he is going to try and convince you that if the Lord really loved you, he wouldn't let these hard things happen in your life. So that means you can't possibly trust him. Or he'll say something like, oh, it's not worth it to put those things on the altar. It's not going to change anything. It's not going to change anything. This yeah. world is still awful and it's just going to stay that way. He's a liar. And just like I say all the time, listen, you liar. I know in whom I have trusted. 
That's it. That's thought habit number 11. <laughs> That's a wrap. <laughs> We've only got one more to go. So don't give up now. Make sure to come back for thought habit number 12, which is forgiving and judging righteously helps me progress. And until then, please never forget that the worth of your soul is great in the sight of God. The Worth of Souls podcast is not an official publication of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you have any questions about the doctrines discussed here, please visit the church's official website for clarification.